Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 12, titled Definitely Miami, which is, as I have to understand it, one of the more popular episodes of Miami Vice, not just when it originally aired, but also with Miami Vice fans. But I think our Miami Vice in-house fan, our super fan in-house, does not agree with that statement. <laughs> It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> this episode does it have anything to do with the fact that ultra Republican Ted Nugent is guest starring in the episode. <laughs> yeah, that that does have put a little bit of damper on the episode for sure. <laughs> you don't agree with the life choices of bow hunting, pro gun <laughs> agenda. No, I'm like pretty much the opposite of that, right? I mean, that's like polar opposite there. You guys don't eat a steak for dinner every night. <laughs> I no, think, I think <laughs> tofu our steak? No. marriage has been a statement against those things. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys are the anti Ted Nugent. Yes. <laughs> this episode originally premiered on January 10th, 1986. We are out of 1985, and I'm sad to see it go. Music and movies were so great in 85. 86 just sucks so bad. <laughs> Hey, 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 leave 86 alone, okay? I'm very happy to get to 86 because that means I'm born. Yeah, he's actually alive now, okay? The writers of this episode were Michael Anemon and Daniel Pine, who actually wrote under a pseudonym. He wrote the episodes Heart of Darkness, Little Prince, Brights of Passage, For the Prodigal Son. He has a very deep episode writer's list, so this is kind of a, a an all-star Miami Vice writer's team. The director is Rob Cohen, who also directed Evan and Made for Each Other. And we've talked about him a bunch because he directed the trip, one of the movies from the Triple X franchise. He directed the original Fast and the Furious, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked a lot about him. So we have all hands on deck, best of the best so advice. we can blame him for Vin Diesel. <laughs> hey, it's worth getting Vin Diesel just for the movie Pitch Black. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just not say anything over here. <laughs> You're not a fan of the Riddick? That's <laughs> eh, all right. <laughs> Before we get started, checking into what's going on in each other's lives. And we went to the Tempe Mall. It's a college town. Nice big mall. And we're walking around, and we made a startling discovery, being being Melissa, being children of the 90s. I like how you say Melissa. Like, you weren't a child of the 90s. You're not that much younger than me, first of all. <laughs> Act like you're like a decade younger or something. <laughs> Melissa and I, having grown up, I mean, teenagers in the 90s. John, you're a little bit behind that. You're kind of at the tail end. You'd be surprised to know that what we thought was fashionable in the 90s has now come full circle. And our teenager now wants to dress like we did in the 90s, which means she's going to look ridiculous. Yes, ridiculous and uh, short skirts and, <laughs> and <laughs> overalls, halter tops. And <laughs> those Junko Side. jeans with the big bell on the bottom of them. No, I hope no. That, Side that ponytails and leggings, <laughs> yeah, neon exactly. leggings. That, that's, yeah, you had that the whole uh, big baggy jeans has not come back in. It's more like almost like mom jeans or something that she was looking at. And they had like embroidered like these terrible patches on there, like roses. And <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, she oh. was showing me some jackets that you could get where it's got the crybaby with Johnny Depp on them. <gasps> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. That's a thing? You can oh, get my those? God. I could just see Melissa and Isabel wearing <laughs> a crybaby jacket. Matching crybaby jackets. <laughs> well, we have. We actually have. This is a pretty good episode. It's a little slow. Things drag on for a long time in the beginning. But this is a good episode. So let's go over there and go, go break this one down. All right, we don't have a classic Miami Vice long open. This is actually a very, very short open, which actually doesn't but Can mean... I ask you guys, right off the bat, there's some kind of strange volcano exploding, like, funky lighting thing going on? Yeah, the, <laughs> right the on the screen. Starting. Like, is that supposed to what be, like, some that? kind of metaphor or something, or what is that? They do it throughout I, I, the whole no. episode. Yeah, what is that? The only thing I can put together is that the theme throughout this entire episode is that it's so hot, it's making people act crazy. And yeah, so, that's what the sun, right? We kept talking mm -hmm. about the sun and stuff. Like, why is the sun in there all the time? So I think that's mm -hmm. what that's supposed to be is close-ups of this, like, solar flares coming off the sun to signify that Florida is especially being punished this week by God and the sun. <laughs> Mostly God, though. Miami Vice is 
always sweaty. Showing me close-ups of the sun isn't going to make it any less icky. <laughs> In this opening, you get this long drive of a car going out to, like, is it like a sand mine? Are they mining sand? I don't sand? know what that's supposed to be. <laughs> is it where they comb the beach, maybe, and they put it is all it over there? Is it a quarry? There? Maybe it's like a rock quarry or something, and there's, like, the leftover. I'm pretty sure it's a quarry for sand. Like, they just got so much sand, they could mm. just they, they dig up the sand. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess. This, so this man drives all the way out. There's a car wait, waiting for him. There's no one else around. It's like this quarry-looking place. And the only way I can describe this guy is that he looks like Drew Barrymore's husband and the wedding singer. He's on the level of that guy and how he looks, like with the with the pants and the jacket and the sunglasses. And he's driving the, the, the really nice Porsche when he gets out there. Well, you know that guy mm-hmm. in The Wedding Singer, he, he loves Crockett, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's why he looks like that. He dresses like that. <laughs> the, the man gets out. He says, he starts saying the, the name Callie. He taps on the window from behind him. Our our big guest star for this week, the Nuge, Ted Nugent, appears and shoots and kills him. We have no warning. No, no other words are exchanged. Nothing to signify that this was going to happen. He just shoots and kills him. Then he walks over, the nuge walks over to the car, puts on some rubber gloves, pulls out a bag full of cash, had a gun in it, tosses the gun away. He gets the, he takes the briefcase, throws it in his car, and then does, is there like a, a backhoe there that he uses to fill that car with sand? Yeah, it must be. Yeah, some I, kinda, yeah. Yes. Just kind of magically hits a button and the car <laughs> just fills with sand. <laughs> As we find out later in the episode, even, I mean, if you go back to the beginning and watch, there are numerous piles of sand out there. Yeah, there's a lot of piles of sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just buries so, the car in sand and he drives away. And that's the end of the opening. Can, can I give Vice credit for one thing? It it looked like they really did bury a Porsche in sand. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering, because this, this episode is particularly filled with nice vehicles. Mm-hmm. We have a Maserati. Later we get Trans Am. There's all kinds of nice cars. We had the Porsche, like... This had to be like the highest budgeted cars episode. How yeah. much do you think it cost back then to destroy a, a Porsche? I don't know, but they're being rough on the Ferrari now too. Like so, at the end when Crockett comes out to the same place, spoiler, yeah, he's like spoiler. just haul, he's just hauling ass through the sand. Like it's like we just own this thing, we just do whatever you want to it. So they're they're treating the Ferrari. Do, do that you way think too. they're this up? You know, and they're like, <laughs> screw it, we have the insurance. <laughs> when we come back from the credits, we're at like a beach club or is a hotel, maybe? The hotel. Right on the beach. And it's Tubbs and Crockett. They're waiting at like poolside, kind of kind of an elevated above the pool. This is a, this is a really long first scene for, for the episode. And it's very, very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it's, sexy, it's right? very <laughs> long. And it can be summed up with very few words. Crockett <laughs> is getting cat scratch fever. <laughs> He's also getting very sweaty. <laughs> we see the theme that Tubbs thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tubbs thinks it's really funny. Yeah, Tubbs is compl- He's complaining. It's very, very hot. They're waiting for this man named Clemente, who's supposed to come out of the, quote unquote come out of the cold. We find out later that it's it's, it's a criminal that they're going to bring in. That way, he can testify against organized crime. So they're helping the feds in this. And then from a mile, so Tubbs and Crockett are talking about this. And from like a mile away, Crockett spies a floozy by the pool. <laughs> and he's got a special ability to be able to spot floozies from from across Miami. Yeah, he has floozy radar. He can find them. It's like uh-huh. a metal detector finding metal in the sand or something. He's like zeroes in on them. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then we get yeah, this and great- he proceeds I hump her for a clear thirty <laughs> seconds. Exactly. Yeah. You get this long scene of like where you get close ups on her sweating and then like oh, breathing. God. And then it turns around and goes close up on Crockett's awkward smiling face as he's staring down at her. Yeah, I know. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> There's all this awkward stuff of like her pouring bottles of water into a bowl and put it put it on a wet t shirt, even though she's poolside. Yeah. Why don't you get in the pool, lady? That's what the pool is for. Why are you sitting in a pool sweating and then not using it? <laughs> we get, this is what I wanted to get to in this opening scene, because obviously we're going to meet this woman's name ends up being Callie. Coincidence. She's mm-hmm. gunning after Crockett hard. I don't know how she knew he was staring at her so bad. She comes up, grabs some ice and rubs it all over her body and then tosses it back into his drink. Ugh. 
it, well, and Tubbs is just like mentally undressing her the entire time while she's doing that for Crockett. <laughs> yeah, he's right behind her. <laughs> Can I just say the saxophone music it, um, in the background is fantastic. <laughs> like it just really set the mood. He's just going to town right before Callie comes up. Tubbs is telling Crockett this. Essentially the same thing that we're saying is that you can see these kind of women from a mile away. It's too hot, Crockett. Maybe the humidity is messing with your brain. And this is an important quote. Crockett says, well, you just got to learn to go with the heat, Rico. This is the exact line that our show is named after. This that exact was the scene, thing. <laughs> this is the thing that we named the show after. So if you're wondering where our show name came from, it's from this exact scene. Sometimes you just got to learn to go with the heat, Rico, because Tubbs is bitching about it being hot in Florida and Sonny's got a hard on for someone poolside. <laughs> that's where our name comes from. <laughs> uh-huh. Sonny's hard on. That's great. <laughs> uh-huh. And so and that, that's when the woman comes up. She's rubs the ice. She grabs the drinks from the waiter who's bringing them to them. She rubs the ice all over her body. She leaves. And Crockett's still like up in cloud nine because he's a he's a um, he's a lover, not a fighter. He he falls immediately in love with Callie for some unknown reason. He's lonely, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the boat is a lonely place. <laughs> <laughs> no one will come over and pet my alligator. Yeah, him and his alligator just like hanging out in the water all the time by themselves, getting drunk. It's a lonely well, thing. Sometimes <laughs> Tub stays in the dinghy. True. Sometimes he lets him come in <laughs> and share. <laughs> he gets to sleep on the part where it's like the table and it turns into a bed. That's where Tub sleeps, that part. <laughs> Before the scene ends, a man comes up and he says he's got a message from Senor Clemente. He's saying that he's scared. He doesn't believe that he's going to be protected. And he wants a woman named Maria Rojas waiting for him on the next time that he comes in. This is while Tubbs. Boy, was he right. <laughs> he actually had the right information <laughs> yeah very smart I'm scared yeah. I don't think you guys can protect me <laughs> all things that could possibly come true <laughs> oh, yeah no spoiler all these things do come true turns out no one was protected <laughs> not Maria not no one Tubbs walked yes. back up he had stepped away to like go call Castillo to say that they were running behind and then when Tubbs was walking up, he scares this man delivering the message. He then pulls the gun. Crockett judo kicks the gun out of the man's hand. And then the man runs off downstairs and jumps into the car of the man with the most amazing hair in the history of us watching Miami Vice. Oh, my God. My it was like a note. shaped mullet or something. I don't know how to explain <laughs> that thing. My exact quote in my notes was, that ghetto, getaway driver is the most 80s thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, it was like a leather jacket, yeah. missing a, a, a sleeveless leather jacket with the earring. And, uh, it was like oh a lightning God, earring, too, fantastic. right? It was like a lightning bolt earring, and then there was like that cut in his hair where it was like an arrow almost. And then in the front, uh-huh. it looked like and, he permed it in the front. <laughs> yeah. And that's the guy they put Trans Am. Yes. yes. Of course. Yeah. I mean, who else could be in the Trans Am but that guy? That guy, uh-huh. that was probably his real car. Like, he's like, nah, I'll just drive my own Trans Am. I got it. Don't worry. <laughs> uh-huh. We cut over to the precinct. This is just a quick scene. Trudy finds out more information on Maria. This is really important information, though, as she's a federally protected witness after writing out her husband. And But there might be some cooperation from the State Department or whoever it is. We, we don't know the organization yet, but that they will cooperate, may, maybe be able to provide Maria in order to get commenting. Basically, the feds are saying... uh We'll pull a witness out of witness protection and put her in harm's way if that means we can get big bad Clemente. Yep, they're, yeah, they're willing to offer her up to get what they want, basically. Now we head back over to the hotel where we were in the very beginning with that long, awkward exchange where Sunny's just <laughs> eye-humping the lady down by the pool. And then she comes over and rubs his iced tea ice cubes all over her body. Because that was a thing that happened in the beginning of this episode. <laughs> and then he sucked the ice cube after that. Yeah. Oh, salty. Gross. <laughs> so they go back to the same bar. They apparently have been working with this bartender who's trying to say, you need to work with someone else. But the duo's back there to find out more information about who that man was that came to deliver the message for Clemente. But of course, when they get back there, Crockett immediately sees Callie, who's sitting in the back. 
and she's sad. She's sitting in the corner of the bar. She's sad. Crockett goes to see her because, of course, he's a chump. He goes over to see her, and she says to leave her. She says to leave her alone. That she just wanted to get him involved in whatever's happening. But as she walks out, Cro- Crockett follows her, and they walk down to the beach. So I do want to point out that the bartender looks like Artie Lang. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yes, he does. <laughs> Very much so. And I love Crockett's line as they're walking down the beach. Sit there and he's like, oh, I'll help you leave your husband. Basically mm-hmm. saying, you should leave your husband and have sex with, I mean, I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is such a sucker for these types of women, right? And he yeah. immediately falls in love, like head over heels in love with these women. He really wants, he's like uh-huh. got that complex where he wants to be like the knight in shining armor or whatever. I'm going to save mm-hmm. these troubled women and turn their life around. I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and when they get the over to like. is that most of them are criminal. He doesn't see it. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's weird. He like takes her over to like this witness protection house that's out on the beach within walking distance of this hotel. I don't think that was to help her escape her husband. I think that was because he didn't want to bring her home because after he was done <laughs> having sex with her, he might not want her to know where she lives. But for the record, for the record, he never had sex with her, though. Yeah, that's something that we learn later at the yeah. very end of this episode. That even in the scene, when he takes her over to the house. She's saying that she's in a bad marriage, that he's a bad man. And but then when they get to this house, she immediately lays it on like, "I'm already here to have sex with you." And she lays, she takes it as soon as they get there. She takes a shower. She's not exactly uh-huh. a shy woman. <laughs> yeah, I don't know you very well. I just met you. Let me take a shower in your shower and put on your robe, and then I'm gonna come out and tell you all about how I want to have sex with you. Yeah, and then lay on the bed. You, she must be performance anxiety. <laughs> Too much pressure. <laughs> She tells him too that men are his are her job, and yes. he's still trying to play the angle like I'm here to help you. You can trust me. I want to help you she, get away from this guy. She gives off a ve- very Russian mail order bride vibe. <laughs> you know, and that's her. And Tubbs kind of makes fun of her accent throughout the whole episode too. Every time they bring it up when they're ta- when those two are talking, he's he's making fun of her accent. Yeah, and they keep in the in the um, like. Uh, captions it said like it was french i'm like was he trying to be french in that <laughs> did i miss that that was supposed to be french it, it is kind of it is kind of funny that Tubbs is making fun of her accent when he's so <laughs> terrible at him hey he's jamaican all right <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the scene we get the feeling like they have she is successful in seducing him they have sex we come back the next day, we're back at the precinct, and Tubbs is meeting with a man named Joe Dalva, who's with the, quote, Organized Crime Task Force. And with and Castillo. Man, is he a jerk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, <laughs> he's a jerk. <laughs> he is. He immediately, he crushes both Tubbs and Castillo, like, right out of the gate. Castillo introduces Tubbs to, J- to Dalva. Let's call him Dalva. They introduce him to Dalva. And this is at the request, this is for the part with the Ma- Maria Rojas story that Clemente wants to see Ma- Maria in order for him to, 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 to surrender himself. Joe immediately calls Tubbs Rick, and you see Tubbs' face just just collapse when he hears him call him Rick. Yeah, he does not like nicknames, clearly. He's like me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no nickname. <laughs> we have that in common. And then Dalva says that the Organized Crime Task Force really wants to come in and they're willing to compromise Maria. But as we know, Castillo 100% by the books and he is not willing to sacrifice the or jeopardize the witness protection program they have in Miami just to bring down one person. Because if, if, if Maria gets killed or something like that, which is what Dalva is saying, like we're willing to sacrifice them, no one is going to trust them when they want to put them in witness protection. It's like, no one will know that we've done this. It won't get out. It'll be just a one-time thing. He's saying like, no one will know. We'll only just... We're just going to let one witness be killed. No one will care. <laughs> and, and then you have Miami Vice, who have a track record of uh, 0% witnesses protected. <laughs> so they're like, no, we have to protect the witness at all costs. I would say the only witness that we It'll know give for us a fact. a bad name. 
So the only one that has survived from the very beginning has been Al Lombard, and then he backed out and didn't testify correctly. So we're still batting zero for the nope. for the vice. The team. guy from the Everglades, he he testified and he survived. True. The, the dad, True. yeah, the dad from the Everglades. But they had to kill people. like two hundred people to do it. <laughs> yeah, but those people were jerks and they deserved to die anyway. There's like two hundred. They killed an entire town in the yeah, swamp. Yeah, well, I'm not missing that town in the swamp. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The last little bit of information from this scene at the with Dalva is that we find out that Maria is Sergio Clemente's little sister. We head back over to the beach. We have a quick scene where Tubbs and Crockett are talking. Crockett is telling Tubbs all about his sex capades with Callie that she ran back to her husband. Crockett saying there's something weird about her, but apparently, from my perspective, not weird enough for his penis. So he's willing to keep <laughs> yeah. he's willing to keep talking to her. And then Tubbs well, is telling. Well, it's- so he's almost a little confused about why she went back to her husband. You know, kind of like, I, I, I love the girl. Good, Ricky. I don't know why she <laughs> left. Ricky. Rick. <laughs> hey, Rick, I did a real good job laying it down. <laughs> and then Tubbs just talks about Dalva, saying that he thinks that Dalva thinks he's going to wipe out all of the organized crime in the Southeast by bringing in Clementi. So they're just kind of having like a bro talk walking on the beach. <laughs> Holding hands, growing. <laughs> we have it must another. Have been out of horses. <laughs> <laughs> we have another really fast scene too, where they have where the duo and Dalva are driving together in Tubbs' car, and they go out to go see Maria's attorney. His name is Alfred Clark, and the only thing that Alfred Clark is there to do, they go meet up in a parking garage. It's like daytime while they're driving, then it's nighttime at the parking garage. Alfred Clark introduces himself and tells Dalva that Maria is not going to help them. She's in witness protection. She's not going to do it. And Dalva is like super aggressive, grabbing him, trying to pull him back, and then says that she's in the car, isn't she? He runs over to open the car door to grab her. But inside is a German shepherd that scares the bejesus out of him. <laughs> Dude, that was so awesome. It, it was like the attorney she, like shows up. He goes, you know, she doesn't want to come out of hiding because she doesn't want to die. Which, I mean, who the fuck is that? <laughs> the guy goes for the, the car door. And you can see the lawyer is like, oh, no, don't open that door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's like, she's not in there. Don't open that door. And then the dog, like, yeah, wanders out. That, that, it's boom, Jeremy Shepard. Like, <laughs> like, all right, all right, golf clap, lawyer. Like, you came prepared. You brought a guard dog. Yeah, he goes, and she's very protective. Or <laughs> at the end, <laughs> I might hire that guy. <laughs> So now we go later that night. We go to where Croc is going to get his face punched in by the nooch. <laughs> we don't know that yet, though. Yes. That's advanced knowledge on that one. <laughs> Crockett goes over to see Callie to find out why she went back to her husband. And she's there alone. He's not uh, her husband. His name's Charlie. is not there. She says that Charlie will hunt, will hunt her down. She doesn't want to get Crockett mixed up in any of this. All the writing is on the wall. That Crockett is like a pigeon. And he's he's a mark, whatever you want to call it. See, they're gunning after him. He's a rube. They have he's him an cornered. Idiot. <laughs> he's stupid. He can't see it from a mile away. I even thought maybe if this. Hopefully, this isn't Crockett. Maybe this is his Burnett character because that's what Callie knows him as. Is Burnett? Like maybe Burnett is dumb and he's just <laughs> saying in the part. Well, I mean, I think Solid we established point. that part. He is dumb because he keeps so, using the name Burnett <laughs> over and over again. Uh, he's approaching it. He's giving her a fake name. He's giving her a fake address. Maybe this is just a just a you know a, an extended one night stand. You know, maybe it's <laughs> Burnett being a womanizer. <laughs> they start getting close. They kiss, and then that's when a man runs in. His name again is Charlie. It's, t- it's Ted Nugent. And just starts beating the hell out of Crockett all over the place. Oh, all over man. the apartment. Crockett mysteriously doesn't put up a fight at all. He just lets the nooch wail on him. Who he, he eventually Dude, how, how, how could you fight back? It's the nooge. <laughs> F with the nooge. He eventually so. pulls a gun I, I out do. on him. Callie yells out, don't do it. She, then he just kicks Crockett out into the hallway. Just think about it. When they were filming this, the 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 size of egos between the two of these, That's and true. knowing that this scene was coming up, how mm-hmm. do you think it was for the director uh, to actually have to go to Crockett and say, like, look, in this scene, the nuge is going to kick your ass, and you're not going to do <laughs> anything about it. 
<laughs> I am sure there was a discussion about that. No, and I would imagine that it could have easily turned into a real fight on set. Yeah, yeah who knows? Yeah, maybe I mean, they're like I mean, best friends or something. That's why he agreed to do it, knowing those two. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm way off. But I mean, just with Crockett being the football star war hero, seems like uh, he's his character is a little overcompensating. Just imagine him having to take a uh, butt whooping from Ted Nugent, this rock star. <laughs> the, the next morning, we go over to where they're going to do the Clemente the comment exchange, where he's going to go surrender himself. And the plan is, from Castillo, is that they're going to plant someone, because they couldn't get Maria, they have a look-alike, that's going to be Maria, which we find out later looks absolutely nothing like Maria. Yeah, I know. When we do nothing. meet her later. <laughs> Gina would look more like that Maria was... <laughs> than that lady. <laughs> that was kind of my note was like, I bet you this she looks nothing like his sister. <laughs> and dude, that was the most awkward scene or meetup. So there's cops everywhere on either side of the bridge, and they let the limo through, mm-hmm. and the limo just kind of drives slow, kind of like when you're driving by a construction site, and you have to go slow, everyone's yes. going like five miles an hour. And Dava says the, the entire time, if this isn't going to work, Castillo's willing to take the risk, because again, he's by the books, he's not going to compromise Maria. And of course, Clemente recognizes immediately that it's not his sister, calls on the radio and says, it's not my sister, I'm leaving, and then... Castillo has to call his troops down. Now, Melissa, you were saying that the police there, they look suspiciously like real Miami cops. I'm convinced they don't use actors for the Miami-Dade police force because, like, they all look like, they look like real cops. All the mustaches and haircuts that they had going on. <laughs> like, if you ever watch They're cops... always eating donuts. Exactly. <laughs> no, if you ever watch cops, the, the first seasons of cops mm-hmm. before, because it started in the late 80s and then into the uh-huh. 90s and then on, on, and on. But they were always in the beginning seasons, they were always in Miami-Dade County. Crap always goes down and there. And they always <laughs> have mustaches. And they all look like that. And it's like, I'm telling you, I think they just took, they're like, yeah, you guys want to make a little extra money? <laughs> like, you know, the extras in the show. <laughs> Well, the other thing that happens in this scene that's great is Tubbs calling out Crockett. They have, they're having a conversation. They're there, but they're not actually participating in anything. They're just kind of there to, to help with overseeing this exchange, this failed exchange. And Tubbs is telling Crockett, quote, This is one of the things I really like about you, Crockett. You're like a magnet. You attract some of the weirdest women in the Western Hemisphere. Man, truer words were never spoken. <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> and this is Richard's where Crockett... bringing the truth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is where Crockett's telling Tubbs that he thinks he's the, that, that they're running the game on him. So Crockett finally understands what's happening here. And he's really hurt. He spends the rest of the episode really, really hurt that Callie would do this to him. After all that staring he did at her at the poolside, he can't believe she would all of a sudden do this to him. <laughs> yeah, dude, we get so much sad Crockett after this, and it's um, what was that episode? The one with the, his girlfriend, and the one where Tubbs, who stayed there. Yeah, yeah, where Tubbs, Tubbs got beat up, punched because mm-hmm. he's not there. We get that sad Crockett, like sad enough he needs to go go do some man thinking while driving his boat around around in the ocean. Oh, <laughs> yes. that happens. I'm yes, sure like he, he needs to be crying while watching sunsets, like <laughs> sad Crockett. <laughs> So now we go back over to, to the precinct and Tubbs, Dalva, Castillo, and Switek are waiting for the Clement or for the Clemente call. Who, when he does, he says he still wants Maria. He goes into this really weird story about being that he wants to make sure that Maria's alive and he wants to see her dance. Like Melissa, this thing was really creepy. He talks about how she used to go to dance. She was really good at dance, and then she would go to dance classes or whatever. And then when she would come home, she would dance just for him. And it was like some weird, creepy stuff. Why would you want your little sister to dance for you like that? That is weird. Pedophile, yeah. like incest, creepy. I don't know what's going on there. Really awkward conversation. He goes off in a couple it of really little tangents is. that don't make any sense. And so Dalva yeah. calls his superiors and he goes over Castillo's head. And Castillo has to has to tuck tail and say oh, they yeah. will he, cooperate he with Dalva on 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. It's really oh, yeah. bad. We have a quick scene where we see Callie. She's sitting on the bed in in her bed in the lingerie, and she just says, "Okay, do your stuff." And you see a skinny, shirtless Ted Nugent come in and slaps her. And then we have we see really fast back at the precinct where Crockett gets the call. We know what's going on here. They're setting Crockett up even further. She's been, she's now been quote unquote abused by her husband. So Crockett is really going to have to, to – they're going to convince him to do something re- really big. This is the hook. This is how they get their people to, to give them money. 
Yes, that's it. Exactly. Meanwhile, in Crockett's head, you know, he's thinking, this guy beat me up. I better kill him. (laughs) Meanwhile, Dalva is being even weirder over at Maria. So now they're going to go pick up Maria and force her to be part of this deal to bring in Clemente. He's like hiding in the bushes outside of her (laughs) safe house. And then she sees him. She tries to run away. He tries to chase her down. And then when she gets into the house, White texts and they're all uncomfortable. Like, I'm sorry the back door was open. I'm really sorry we have to do this to you. And I'm sorry I scared you. Yeah, like, he's poor. I felt so bad for him. He did not want to do that. You could tell he was like, I don't really want to be yeah. here. I don't want to do this. But I have to do it because it's my job and they're forcing me. <laughs> <laughs> the other guy is like yelling at her like, oh, we're not going to let you uh, get killed. Now get in the damn car. <laughs> yeah. If you want to stay in the program? If you want to stay in the program, you'll get in the car. She's saying he's going to kill me. He killed my husband who she testified in court against he killed him he's gonna kill her now she doesn't want to do it and he says we're not gonna protect you anymore then he basically says that so now they have her cornered like she has to cooperate yeah what else is she gonna do she's gonna die either way right like she's gonna mm-hmm. die with their protection or she's gonna die without their protection because they, yep. they, they don't offer protection they offer her up basically so later that night, we go back over to Callie's and Crockett is apparently on a good enough relationship with her. He just lets himself right into her house and she's in bed. She's is, is that up. what's going is, No, no, that's, is that what that's it the is? house. Or, or is she still at the... She's at the um, she went to the safe house. She's oh, like, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I hope you're not mad that I came here. She went to the house he took her to. Oh, okay. She's his friend's house. He just like that's, goes there intuitively when she won't answer mm-hmm. the phone. Yeah, He's no, like, oh, I'm going to go over here. there for some Crockett alone time. Just sad Crockett. True. Place yeah, that's part of it. And then she tells this story that's like, you can see Crockett's face. Like, this is some grade A. I mean, this is even grade A bullshit. This is like B or C grade. Like, this is the worst story ever. She says that after he left last night that her husband kept hitting her. And then in order to get him to stop, she said that she was talking to Burnett Crockett because... He would buy two kilos of Coke off her husband who's desperate to move it and they really need the money and it's $60,000 for the drugs. So she was just trying to make a drug deal with Burnett. How does she know that that's his cover for a a drug dealer? Most of them are saying the exact same thing. Yeah, most of them are saying the exact same thing. I was saying, like, how does she get these people who will buy the drugs? Because, like, she, he never once says he's a drug dealer, and he was not even there to buy drugs when he... How did she did know? Everyone, <laughs> did every guy in the 80s wear a white suit and sell drugs in Miami? <laughs> Is that what was just happening? Like, everyone sells drugs. You can ask the, the bellhop, hey, you want to buy two kilos? Sure. <laughs> and you can see on Crockett's face, he's like, uh, this is this is worse than I imagined it would be. At least try and come up with a decent story. I mean, this is their angle that they're going to be, that they're going to try and pretend like every time she's going to get beat up. And then you have to buy in order to, to make it so he doesn't kill her. Her husband doesn't kill her. That you have to go buy the drugs off of him. Like every single man in that scenario would be like, whoa, this got, this got weird really fast. Maybe I should just back out of this one. Also, uh-huh. are all these men have just sixty thousand dollars laying around? Yeah, like, that's the other thing. Like we've met a drugs. lot of people. <laughs> yeah, we've seen a lot of people in this. That like last week with the PTA, where they're gonna buy all the drugs. Like they just all, each of them happen to have twenty five thousand dollars laying around. Miami well, the PTA rich people, has twenty uh, has sixty thousand dollars lying around, or at least they <laughs> used to. <laughs> the next day, we see Callie again. She's back over at her place, and she's just telling. Charlie, uh, that one, her and Crockett never had sex because he's old fashioned. He didn't want to do that. They want to take advantage of her. And then she tells Charlie, sure. also, don't shoot him in the face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't have sex with him, but don't shoot him in the face because he's pretty. <laughs> she's such a gem. She really is a catch. I lady. think she's lying <laughs> to the nude. I think she totally boned down. <laughs> nah, I don't think so. Well, we have come a- on. He's abusive. She can't outright tell him, like, hey, I, I let him. Go to town with me. Yeah, see, I think it's the she's other lying. way, though. She's I don't the think one that's abusive. controlling him. Yeah, yeah, I think he's really stupid, and he just does what she wants him to do. And mm-hmm. so, it, that, that he didn't, I mean, if he really wanted to beat her up, he could have really beat her He just hit her the once, right? Like, I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she told him to do it. That way they can corner. So, who knows who's in charge in this relationship, but she doesn't do any of the dirty work, right? Like, any of the killing or the moving of the drugs or anything. She just does the she's manipulation the half. <laughs> Yeah. Unfortunately, she's the brain for <laughs> <of> the operation. <laughs> uh. So I'm going to breeze through some stuff really fast here so we can get to the final scenes. 
One, we see at the precinct, Croc is getting fit with a wire. Him and Zito are going to go together to go bring down Charlie. We also see Tubbs. He finds out from Castillo that Gina has a line on Clemente's messenger guy. Then we have this really like un- like awkward goodbye between Tubbs and Crockett, where Tubbs and Crockett are both assuming that Crockett's going to die. <laughs> That's where Pretty basically much. they're both they're both going. We hope to see each other again. The only protection that Look, Crockett's going to have. I know you didn't have... do too good against the Nuge the first time. So <laughs> if I don't see you Monday, I'll know what happened. <laughs> the only protection that Crockett's going to have is a bulletproof briefcase that he's bringing with. Uh, what about Zito? He's not protection. <laughs> well, Zito shoots and misses a few times before he finally gets no, his mark. <laughs> he shot his feet. You know, like like a, maybe a regular off. policeman his is, is supposed to do. You know, you guys are always making jokes about how they murder everybody. Maybe he was trying to take him in alive. No, I, for I, I just, I, he was thrown off because of the lack of a beard. <laughs> you know, the ponytail changed changed the his 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 uh, aim a little bit. Yeah, that's yes. true. <laughs> <laughs> we see really fast where Tubbs and Gina run down Clemente's messenger. We find out he's a refugee. He's only met Clemente the one time. He said that was a strange conversation that Clemente only said he wanted to see Maria dance again. The scene meant nothing. They could have totally cut this out of this episode. It meant absolutely nothing. So now they we go could have. And I don't know why the driver, the getaway driver, wasn't there, too. I wanted to see him again. <laughs> She should have been a participant in that scene. <laughs> so now we go over to the Clemente arrest. It's in like a shipyard where they have a bunch of like um, concrete casings for roadwork type type drainage and stuff like that. There's a ton of cops there. There's cops scattered everywhere. This is also like the worst possible spot for them to do this meet because there could be people hiding almost anywhere because all of them are like empty pipes so there could be gangs of people re- ready to pounce on the cops too so the, they're gonna protect the witnesses this time <laughs> they're totally gonna protect the witness this, this time i'm be confident different. totally confident <laughs> <laughs> this time's gonna be different i mean how could it go wrong with all those cops well, i know they're both nervous i know they're both nervous but they're both gonna be okay this is going to be a success. We're going to... She... Uh, I'm telling you, she's going to dance again for her brother. Yep. <laughs> well, the limo pulls up. Comente's limo pulls up. A police van pulls up and lets Maria out. She she tentatively walks out to the middle, waits for her brother. Clemente gets out, goes, walks up to her, gives her a hug, and during the hug, Maria pulls out a switchblade and stabs Sergio and then starts screaming she had to, that Clemente was going to kill her. Just screaming and screaming. Clemente goes down and eventually dies. And then a sniper from a tower, not even in Miami, so far away, shoots and kills Maria. And now everyone is dead. So for the record, she did the right thing because he was going to kill her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So at least he died too. He was going to kill her. She was very right. He was going to kill her. And he (laughs) succeeded. Yeah, so either way, so, they, they both died. Yes. Well, then he wasn't prepared or was for her to stab him. So, <laughs> Well, in the episode, uh, too, we, we go back and forth. Like, now we, we would we would actually head over to the to the mine where the deal is going to happen with Charlie. But I'm just going to sum up this last scene of the, of the Clemente arrest where you see Dalva sitting on the ground, crushed. His whole, he had, like, promotions in his head that, on how this was going to work out for him. And he's just sitting on the ground, staring off into nowhere. And Castillo comes walking up and just stares at him. It was like, I told you. I told you. Uh, this is all your fault, basically. That was the look Castillo had in his face. Like, this is all your fault. I guess we're going to never dance again. No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, it's because guilty people got no rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome out there. <laughs> so now let's finish up the Charlie scenario. Uh, and again, it's like a, it's a sand mine, a sand quarry, maybe. I don't, I don't know what the hell, where the hell they're at. They're mining for sand. <laughs> Crockett races out there. No regard for the Ferrari that the Miami Vice cast are renting <laughs> while he's heading out there. He gets <laughs> so up. We only got a couple weeks left, and then it goes back to the dealership. <laughs> Crockett gets out with the it's briefcase. So Ferris Bueller neighborhood with it now. <laughs> Crockett gets out. He's holding the briefcase. He looks at Charlie's car who's par- that's parked there. Charlie walked out from behind one of the mounds of sand and says, you must be Burnett, blah, 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 blah. He pulls out a gun to shoot Sonny, and Sonny must have hit X just at the right time in his video game. 
because he's able to pull up the briefcase and successfully block the bullet, which could have hit him anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so the brilliant move to bring the bulletproof 10 by 10 inch uh, briefcase <laughs> just happened to work out. <laughs> it shoots Crockett back over Charlie's car. Zito pops out from the hillside, like one of the mountains of hill. He pops up and starts shooting at Charlie, and then Crockett pops up, and Zito and Crockett just lay waste to Charlie in a sea of bullets. They, they just unload on him. And I'm, <laughs> it, I was convinced at the time that Crockett brought Zito because he was worried about getting beat up again. Because, um, I mean, come on, last time Ted took his lunch. Uh, uh, you know, I did think it was Ted Nugent dying in a hail of gunfire, fire, I think is the definition of irony. True. It would have been better if it was a bow and arrow, right? No. Uh-huh. <laughs> Elf, is a little salty. pops up out of it, out of nowhere and shoots it with an arrow. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Well, the last scene at the at the sand mine is the cop. It makes that- no sense. <laughs> it's the sand for those little like bottles you can buy at the fair, where they like dye the sand. That's where they get they get that from. <laughs> we just see that we see that the cops are there. They're they're cleaning up the scene and they're finding buried cars all over the yes. all over this area. There are many many other people who have met this fate. Which makes you think, like, was it really a salt mine or was he just really burying those people out there and that was it? It's just like the beach or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, what, where, well, where is that? I, I just, the cops are sitting there and there's like a, a cop on every sand all the way around. They're like, there's a dead drug dealer here. There's a dead drug dealer over here. And I'm thinking in my head, like, did the Miami Vice Squad just think they were really good at their jobs? Because, like, all these drug dealers <laughs> just disappeared magically. <laughs> you know, oh, Ted Nugent's single-handedly stopped the drug trade in Miami because he's ripping them all off and burying them in sand. And then we get to the next most ridiculous scene of him walking, Crockett walking down the beach with the blonde Russian mail order bride. Well, and- but my favorite part of this scene is that when it first comes in, see, so now they're, they're going to go bust Callie. And when we first come, we see Callie. She's just built in a sandcastle out on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> she's like a murderer, but she's just out there like, I like sand. <laughs> I really like, I mean. Yeah, well, and, and Crockett like walks up all like hands in the pocket, sad Crockett, like we got to talk. <laughs> and, and they start walking down the beach. And then they get to a point, and it's like she's pretty much saying, like, give me one more chance. Don't arrest me, you know? Yeah. And there's a police helicopter with cops waiting to pick her up and fly her to jail in a helicopter. My favorite part about this whole thing is that she doesn't even miss a beat that he's alive. She's like, oh, crap. Okay, so my husband's dead. I've got to go with this guy now. He obviously, like, something went down, and he's not mad at me. She's like, oh, I'm so glad you're okay. Yeah, like, and then when she sees the police helicopter and the police, she's like, oh, okay, you're a police officer. So then when the police start walking to my helicopter, she's like arms on the shoulder of one of the police officers rubbing his back as they're walking over to yep, the helicopter. Exactly. She just goes yeah. from, yeah, she doesn't oh. miss a beat. Like, I'm just going to go to this person and that person. Like, oh, okay, you came back. That's good. Like, I'm not sad about my husband being dead. <laughs> Why we're going to go to all these places. I don't I'm going to show you things that you've never never seen before in these beaches and she's telling them like they're gonna go mm-hmm. away together and yeah uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> well and what kicks me about it is like they're not gonna fly a helicopter out just to take one person into custody i thought that too so, like what a waste the, of money the, <laughs> yeah yeah she must be that hot that they were like like crocker was like hey i need you to come arrest this hot blonde well we're the <laughs> helicopter guys why wouldn't you just bring out a car and drive her and he's like no she's a really hot blonde they're like you know what <laughs> Screw it. We'll use the helicopter. What we got a seer. <laughs> we got a seer. She might swim away or something. <laughs> so then the scene ends with Crockett very sad walking along the ocean on the beach. And I really hope that he's walking out of it and he goes and stomps on her sandcastle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Knock that crap down. <laughs> How is he so head over heels for her? He They literally only talked like three times. No, I think I think the point is is that what he talks about it's not like it's one of the things like not it's not her specifically, but it's like mm-hmm. he he can't catch a break and it's because the job is depressing because he talks about it in that episode that you know he's tired of job doing this to him basically that it's, mm-hmm. it can never be one or the other you know mm-hmm. like he can't just be like 
it's I can just ignore it's it. It's a job fault. I'm job. always trying to bang criminals. Yeah, well, exactly. I guess that's. I didn't even think about that until now. This totally fell in his lap that they found a serial killer couple that were murdering people for money. Right. Yeah, this was just like accidental. I'm it wasn't like he was there so like surveilling her or something. Up into, <laughs> up into this point, the vice squad has thought that they were just doing a fantastic job. They just <laughs> stumbled across Ted Nugent. The drug dealing serial killer. Crockett was part of the of the Clemente deal. That's how they met her at that pool because they're waiting for Clemente to come in. Yeah, and then he just went off on his own to go run down yeah, this woozy. He said, "Remember, he kept saying like there's something about her, something weird about her. That's why I need to." Get, basically, he was trying to say, like this is why I need to continue this because there's something weird about her. Yeah, but so, that was after yeah. he ogled her at the pool. She oh, yeah. rubbed no, the ice cube all yeah, over her exactly. body. He then no, sucked yeah. on it. And then they walked down to the safe house and. Apparently, he just couldn't get it up. And so they didn't have by sex the way, that day. She's married. God, you people. How do you get it through your heads? By the way, just the last thing I'm going to say about this is that apparently in one scene, there was a nipple slip that the censors uh-huh. missed yeah. by her. So was it a crocket nipple? You might want to rewatch that episode. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, it's the one where it, it, it basically from... What I read, and I, I I didn't spot it in the episode, so it must happen. John's quick, lying. But, John's um, totally lying. He went back and watched the whole episode just to find that nipple with a I magnifying did, I, glass. I didn't like, rewind it six times before I finally was able to catch it. I only it did and it five, right? it. <laughs> um, But she's pouring the drink in this glass, and apparently you, you get a quick shot of her nipple. I'm so glad uh, that there's experts out action. there on the internet <laughs> scouring <laughs> for this kind of stuff. Well, so you're a Howard Stern fan. You should be well acquainted with Mr. Skin. True. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll save it for my final thoughts. We do a little teaser here. It's just that this is the first episode of the season where all, the entire storyline has been buttoned up. Very all, true. There's no <laughs> loose ends here. We saw everything. So, but before then, wow. let's go over and talk about the music in this episode because I was actually surprised there wasn't as much Ted Nugent as I was expecting. So let's go no. talk about the music. That's not a bad thing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, what do you got for us this week? Because I was expecting the greatest hits of Ted Nugent, but I don't think we got that. Not really. We only got one Ted Nugent song, and it's one of the few Ted Nugent songs I'm not f- very familiar with. It's it sounds like Ang- it's going to be another Angry one of those. young man. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be another one of those ones where it's like, it's kind of, it was kind of written exclusively for Vice, but it ended up on an album. Yeah, you know, and that's what it kind of looks like. This would have been around the time in which Ted Nugent was had formed his super group, Damn Yankees. Ted Nugent started his music career in high school as the lead guitarist for the band Amboy Dukes. So, and I guess they were a house band for like some local teen club. So, way back in 1965, he would perform with them for a while, uh, for actually about 10 years. And he would leave the band in 75 to go on as a solo artist. And that's where most people, I mean, then on, that's where most people know Ted Nugent's work being the Cat Scratch Fever days. In 1982, but from 82 to 89, he would help form the supergroup Damn Yankees, which featured Jack Blade on bass from Night Ranger, Tommy Shaw, the guitarist and vocalist from Styx, mm-hmm. and Michael Cartellone, or Cartellone, who I guess is the current drummer for Leonard Skinner now. And on a side note, Jack Blade, the bassist for Night Ranger, as I was doing my research and writing that, I was literally watching Night Ranger sing the national anthem at the <laughs> uh, NASCAR race, the Vegas race. Oh, weird. Uh, they were singing afternoon. the national anthem at the, at the Las yes. Vegas race today? Weird. Yes, today, watch, I'm watching the race, <laughs> and they go to sing the national anthem, and it's Night Ranger. And I go, hey, look, it's Night Ranger. <laughs> and I'm, I'm Googling the songs, and I come across the part about damn Yankees, but <laughs> bassist from Night Ranger. So Ted Nugent, uh, we've already talked a little bit about him being a big rock star and everything, but I just want to touch a little bit. I mentioned earlier that he is, he's like essentially the Republican rock star. He's pro-gun, he's super conservative, he's very anti-drug and alcohol. He's an avid bow hunter, very pro-hunting. So I was surprised that he's a, well, I shouldn't say surprised, you know, that um, he's a big supporter of the Big Brother, Big Sister program. Hmm. Puts on camps for inner city kids to teach them how to be hunting and <laughs> pro-gun 
rock stars like him. Interesting. Uh, so that's a that's a direction to go, I guess. I did want to talk about a little something. This is just he was married twice, but before he was married. He had a son and a daughter that he gave up for adoption. And I guess in 2002, his daughter sought him out. And in the process, it came to light. He's had two wives. His first wife died in a car crash in 1982. But that was a few years after their divorce. But then there's... He had a long relationship with a 17-year-old Hawaiian girl. Like a 10-year relationship after that marriage. Before he married his current wife. And he has several kids with her. So moving on, we have our <laughs> next song, Europa, Earth's Cry, Heaven Smiles. I love when they do the name of the song, and then they do, like, the extended name of the song in quotation marks. Because <laughs> that, in the extended yeah. verse, the extended name of the song in the parentheses, it can go on forever. It can literally be yeah. the entire song in the parentheses, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and being that it's a Gato Bar- Barbera song, his full name being Leandro Gato. Barbera. Like, so wait, uh, part Argentinian... of his name is in parentheses too. Yes, his yes, name his name is in parentheses too. <laughs> yes, yes. He's an Argentinian jazz musician who's released thirty five albums between nineteen sixty seven and two thousand ten. He's actually worked with some real popular band leaders. The song Europa it's originally a Santana song released on Santana's mm. nineteen seventy six Amigos album. When I saw the song title, I'm like, I wonder if this is his song or if this is the Santana song. The Santana song. So it's a when it comes with like jazz and blues, that's you sing a lot of covers because you you do a lot of your take on someone else's song as like a oh uh, it's almost like an honor to cover someone's song. Europa is essentially just a guitar instrumental. It's just Santana showing just showing off essentially. And this song is one of the few instrumental songs in the music that's not Jan Hammer orchestrated. Mm-hmm. A little bit about Gato. Is he's like I said, he's an Argentinian jazz musician. He was inspired by Charlie Parker, who's like a legend as far as saxophonists go. So he would take a hiatus after his wife Michelle died and and it in the eighties and he actually wouldn't come back to performing until the late nineties. And then he would start performing again. He would perform all the way until he died in two thousand sixteen at the age of eighty three from pneumonia. And one last thing, and I saved this for the very last, because this is gonna make you appreciate this guy Gato. He is the inspiration for the character Zoot. In the Muppet band, Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go Jim so, Henson, too. Get a little deep music reference. I, I know, like, uh, you don't listen to jazz or any of that, or blues or anything like that. Uh, if you ever want to go read, Google that Muppets band, Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. All of the characters from that, including Animal, are inspired by actual artists. And they're, hmm. they're people like him. So... Going to our last song, we have Cry by Goodly and Cream. Goodly and Cream are an English rock duo that performed between 1977 and 1988. Cry was off of their Art of Noise album in 1985, which was a remix, a remixed grouping of samples of previous recordings to a disco beat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they were composed of Kevin Goodley and Lol Cream. His real name is Lawrence <laughs> Neil Cream, but he's often referred to as Lolagon. But they, known on albums as Lol Cream. L O L Cream. Although I can't imagine he's still using that today. I can't imagine wanting to go by Laugh Out Loud Cream. That's just. <laughs> that's not a name. <laughs> the pair were in a rock band or a pop band called the 10CC and a couple other bands in the early 70s. They would take a break to further develop a, quote, Gizmatron, that's the name they call it, <laughs> which was a module that attached to the bridge of a, of a guitar and created a violin a, a violin like bowing effect after making a recording and demonstrating it to their record label Mercury Records Mercury Records was like hey why don't you just make just keep going and make the whole record <laughs> wow so goodly and cream was born <laughs> they would go on 
<laughs> they would go on to continue recording an album, which would turn into a three-concept LP. This three-concept LP was called Consequences, and in 1979, it featured music, comedy routines, and spoken <laughs> word. So they're like, we really don't know what to do, so let's just throw some shit together. Oh, it gets better. It focused on environmentalism and veganism and mm. other hippie crap. <laughs> What a weird mix that they're on the same episode as the, as Ted Nugent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Basically, these guys had a decent pop career in the 80s. I don't, I've never heard of them. What they're probably most known for is their work as uh, directors of music video. Just some notable music videos that they directed. They directed, they did The Police's Every Breath You Take. Oh. Frankie Goes to Holloway, Hollywood's The Power of Love. And they did multiple songs for each one of these artists. I'm just mm-hmm. naming the big ones that I recognize. They did Everybody Have Fun Tonight by Wang Chung. They directed that. Wow. Okay, so, so they this... weren't all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so but yeah, they directed some pretty... into Miami Vice music, too, because we've talked about almost all of these songs. Yeah. So, but it, they're responsible for more than fifty music videos directed in the eighties. But thank God they quit music and started making music <laughs> videos. Um, well, I, so. I would I would have never thought in the beginning of this music segment that we would have not only Ted Nugent but then an album named with veganism in the <laughs> yeah. title. So th- those two would come together. The spoken word. I wa- <laughs> I love the spoken word. Well, let's go over and talk about our closing thoughts on this episode. I'm sure. Um, I don't know if it's going to be mixed feelings. I think we're actually all on board for this one. Let's go over and talk about our final thoughts. All right, guys, I'll, I'll kick off this week. You know, this was a good episode, actually. I really liked it. was slow in the beginning, but it was for a reason. You tried to build up how Crockett sees this woman, and then you write Melissa about his loneliness, I guess, and the, the trials of the job on him and him building this relationship with a woman. He immediately falls for her, which is classic Crockett. We have all the classic vice tropes in this episode, including the Castillo stare. I mean, we we basically worked in everything. Switek being uncomfortable, Castillo stare, Crockett falling head over heels for a woman. It's It's got everything that Miami Vice does well. It has good vice writers and directors behind it. So this was good all around. Like, it was a really good episode. I really liked that. All of the stories were summed up. We got an ending to every single thing. Not, not, nothing was left out there, and we didn't get a freeze frame for an ending. So I really did like it. I had it, it, it wasn't fun. Like we've had some 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 episodes recently, but it was a good episode of Miami Vice, and I don't have anything bad to say about it other than maybe it was a little slow at times. But otherwise, I really I really liked it. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I really liked this episode. My, the only like sour note. <laughs> <laughs> it has its Ted Nugent. <laughs> so, yeah, but I won't go off on a tangent on that. But yeah, no, I like this episode. It once again showcases that I, I always feel sorry for Crockett. He seems so lonely. He just wants someone <laughs> to love him. Why won't someone just love him? I don't understand it. Besides besides Rico. No, I'm saying. <laughs> we know they love each other, but <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean. It was a good episode. It, it was all encompassing and nobody, you know, no goo. There was really no goofiness to this episode, though, right? Mm-hmm. There was no, mm-hmm. like, silliness or whatever, which is fine with me. I don't really like the silliness as much as everyone else does, but so I can go with that. The more serious note. Yeah, yeah. the brooding, the brooding Crockett. I think this episode's a good primer for what's going to come to us in season three. Yeah, there's a lot of brooding in season three. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of big, heavy duty stuff. But yeah, I think it's it was good. And you're right, it, it, it did close out. There was an ending, which is nice. I always like when there's an ending. I didn't like Crockett being sad as an ending, though. <laughs> he needs someone to be there to help him walk along the beach. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> I liked it. Well, John, what are your final thoughts? I, I'm in agreement with you guys. I like the episode. I agree with you, Dom. It was a little slow at times. I've never been a big fan of rooting Crockett, but I will say I'm starting to uh, I'm starting to come around on it. I was really hoping the end there, where she uh, where where they they take her to jail in a helicopter, was gonna do was gonna go uh like a mash ending kind of way, like they fly away and Crockett had spelled out I love you and rocks on the beach. He chases after you know? the helicopter. No. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the mash music playing. Um, I I liked it, and uh, I I think Melissa brought up a good point. This, this, there wasn't as much goofiness in this, and I think it made the episode go a little bit smoother because there wasn't those random unnecessary goofy moments that were you know because some like we've talked about where sometimes they just feel forced so i think everything kind of ran a little smoother with that i'm i'm starting to get a feeling though that castillo just seems like he's starting to become that police chief that just pops his head out of the office you know and gives a look like his character is becoming a little bit too one-sided for me either in the office or he's got his machete out and he's gonna go murder some fools <laughs> yeah well, i mean like in the episodes where he has the machete out like you get to see like ninja castillo like you get to see who castillo is you know i feel like what we, we're starting to get a lot of castillo's stare but that's it you know we're getting mm-hmm. him popping out of the office and doing his you know gruff look and and no nonsense line. And then he's back in the office. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. You can get us on Twitter. You can find all the ways, all the other ways that you can communicate with us on our website. Go with the heat.com. Click on about us. You can find all the ways that you can holler at us. You can go to that web, same website. Go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe. Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. YouTube. We just started adding the This Week in Vice episodes to a new brand new app called Anchor FM. So if you're using that, you can find those a- those episodes over there too. That's going to do it for us this week. You can see we, we really enjoyed this episode. So we'd love to hear your feedback on what your thoughts are on this episode. That's going to do it for us this week and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.